uh, first I want to cover some of the things you want to think about when you're looking at a vintage sewing machine. Maybe you find it in a thrift store or uh, maybe you find it on, on the internet, on places like eBay and, and you know, bidding sites. Um, you may find it on Craigslist uh, where I sell mine or you may find it, uh, you may know someone who just wants to get rid of one. Uh, one of the first things to know is that when people advertise these machines, sometimes they'll call them rare. Uh, a few people I think might be exaggerating. Most people just, they're, they're not intentionally doing that. They really don't know. To them, they think it's rare, um, and they're not. There are, I've been restoring machines for over five years now, and honestly, uh, almost six years, and I've only come across a very few machines that were truly rare. There just weren't many made. And, uh, but, but many machines are collectible, and, and they're not necessarily rare. And this is actually one of them. This is the Singer 201. Um, but people call them rare just because they think they are. Or sometimes people call them industrial machines or industrial quality. Uh, and they are not. They were built for home use. They were called domestic machines and they were built for the home. They were built for, they were sort of, um, sort of the general practitioners of the sewing world for the home because they had to sew a variety of things. Everything from silk, handkerchiefs, all the way to sewing heavy, heavy curtains for people's windows and, and all sorts of things. So they had to do a variety of things. A lot of people call these industrial, and I think it's in part because they're, you know, many of the vintage machines are all metal. Sometimes they're really heavy, some of them are cast iron. And a lot of people assume that they're industrial, but that's because we, uh, as a society, have become so used to things being made of plastic that are poorly made, they, you know, they're disposable, they don't last. And so I can see why someone might say that. But having said that these are not industrial machines, these machines are amazing. They're incredibly strong. They will outsew virtually any new machine uh, that is made for, the home, for home use. And they, uh, they, you know, when you look at a vintage machine, you give up some things. You don't get some of the modern features like automatic needle up position, automatic needle threader. Uh, you don't. When you do a decorative stitch on a vintage sewing machine, uh, some of the models have that. You do them manually with levers and cams. You don't do it with, say, pushing a button uh, on like a new on a new machine where you would get a decorative stitch. By the way, so you do give up some conveniences, but what you get is a machine that can sew really uh, a huge variety of heavy fabrics and materials that you just can't do with most home sewing machines. And the great thing is that once you get a machine that has been restored, that is ready to sew, not just uh, a machine that runs with the needle moving up and down, so there's a difference, uh, you should be able to take care of the machine yourself. You, you clean the bobbin area, the feed dog area right here, with a brush, uh, keep it free because lint will build up in this area on any sewing machine. And then uh, before each project, you put one drop of oil in the oiling points and that's it. That's really all you should have to do for most vintage machines. You can have it serviced once a year if you like. Usually, if I service someone's machines, and I, I do a lot of work on other people's machines, you know, I'll, I'll check it, I'll check the settings for adjustment. Usually they're fine. Occasionally they need some adjustment. And then um, I'll grease the gears and, and just check it out. And it really is a low maintenance thing. Now when you see posts like the ones I put on Craigslist, you see a lot of maintenance because I'm giving the machines a full overhaul because they've never really, many of them have never had that. And they need a full tune-up and that uh, uh, involves quite a lot of procedures. Um, and so when you're looking at a machine, if someone says, it's, it's very rare that people even have them for sale that say they've been serviced. That in itself is rare. Uh, but if someone claims that they have a machine and it has been serviced or has had a tune-up, it may have, but but go ahead and take that further and ask them to give you, if they can provide a list of the things that they actually did in that servicing and tune-up and find out what they did. Uh, cleaning a machine off and putting oil in it and making sure that it's, you know, the needle moves, that's not really servicing a machine. That's uh, one of the easy things you can do <laughs> for a machine. Um, actually, I, I shouldn't say that because cleaning, uh, the way I clean a machine in a restoration is extremely thorough. So I want to cover a few basic areas for you guys when you're looking at a machine. When you look at a sewing machine, one of the first things you want to do is look at the cord. Now the cord in this machine is actually built into the cabinet. But you want to look at your electrical cords, make sure that they are pliable, that they're not dry rotted. If they are, they can often be replaced, but you want to factor that into the cost of the machine because you're going to have to pay for that, uh, for that cost. Um, 
And you want to look at things like a bobbin winding tire. A lot of the old machines have these wonderful, wonderfully simple bobbin winders. And the tires dry rot. You know, they're rubber, but they can be replaced. And they're not expensive at all. Uh, light bulbs. You know, if you turn it on, the light bulb doesn't work. Well, you can get replacement bulbs. But that's, again, you want to, these are things you want to check. You want to check things like the levers on the machine. This one's fairly simple. It has one main control lever. Some of the vintage machines have quite a few. They have knobs and dials and all sorts of uh, doodads on the front that, that control different functions. And you tend to see more of those as you move in time from, say, 1920. By the time you get into the 50s and the 60s, you've got tons. Of, some of the machines have tons of controls on them. You want to check and see if they work, right? If they're stiff, uh, when I restore a machine, I make sure that they are cleaned, that they're lubricated, that they function. Uh, you want to make sure that someone hasn't broken them. Some of those knobs, they, they require that they be pushed or pulled before they're turned. And over time, sometimes people have broken them. Sometimes people will take something apart, like this is the uh, tension assembly, very important part of the machine. And I've, I actually had a machine once where someone had taken it apart and put it back together in the wrong order, and it wasn't working. And I took it apart and had to re-put it back together. So again, you want to test so on a machine when you buy one. Don't buy a machine without test driving it, okay? Because it, you, you'll, it'll tell you a lot about how it sews a stitch. So let's say you find a machine and you get a chance to run some stitches through it and you see, oh, okay, so is a stitch, not too bad. That doesn't mean it's really ready for prime time yet. What you'll find is the machines were so beautifully engineered and over-engineered for something that was not used 24-7 uh, that very often the, the needle bar, or the needle if it has one in there, will move up and down um, and sometimes it'll even sew a stitch. But what you can't see is there's a lot of things that the machine is trying to compensate for, and it's not really performing the way it was engineered to. And to really appreciate the benefits of the machine, you want to have it restored and gone through. A couple of different areas. There's the hand wheel area here. You want to look at your bobbin, and this, the hand wheel is usually almost always on the right, but you'll find that bobbin winders vary depending on the model of the machine. But the main thing is, remember, is make sure the bobbin winder functions. Uh, have it tested. And, and actually test the bobbin on the, on the, the winder itself. Uh, you want to make sure that the, again, the light, not just the light bulb, but the light switch, that it actually functions. Uh, you want to, again, look at your wiring, make sure it's not frayed or dry rotted. Um, and if it is, you're going you're gonna to want to make sure that that is taken care of before you ever use the machine. Uh, let's see, what else? Your tension area. You want to make sure that this functions, that you can control the tension assembly. This is the upper thread tension, one of the most important parts of the machine that you're going to want to function properly. And <clears throat> another area to think about is, your, of course, your bobbin area, the bobbin case. Does it even have a bobbin case? It may not have a bobbin in it, and that's okay. Bobbins are not, not a big deal. You can get those pretty easily. But some machines, you want to make sure that the bobbin case is there. And if it's there, does it work? Uh, this is a drop-in style bobbin. And so the case on this Singer 2-1 actually stays in place, and you pull the bobbin out itself, which is sort of a real cool convenience. It's one of the things people like about this style of bobbin. But if you have one of the many machines that has a little bobbin case, shaped like a little bird's egg, uh, make sure that it works because it's spring-loaded. You want to take it out, make sure that you know how to wind it, and make sure that it functions, right? That it comes out easily, that it snaps in properly. Uh, one of the reasons that... Um, when you see a sewing machine, and you'll see this online for people who do what I do, who do full servicing, I mean, the full overhauls of the machine, uh, they're priced higher. And you say, well, why is that? You know, I mean, this is, a, this is a basic black Singer sewing machine. It sews one type of stitch. It's a straight stitch. It's a beautiful stitch, but, you know, it's kind of what it does. It sews a lot of great things, and it's one of the nicest Singers ever built. But if you compare it to a modern machine, it's like, well, gosh, you know, I see black singers all the time, and you know, and they don't, you know, they're not particularly collectible. Uh, some of them are, but you know, a lot of them you see them, and they're they're for sale, very really cheap online. Uh, what you want to ask is not so much is it rare, but has it been serviced? This machine, for example, and I chose this as an example because this sewing machine, it takes me probably longer than any of the other machines that I've overhauled, and I've done quite a few of them. Uh, and that's because it has a beltless motor. It's a direct gear drive. That means that the motor is geared to the, tr to the drive shaft that, that uh, drives the needle and the bobbin system, uh, the feed dogs. And so basically taking this motor apart is like taking the transmission of a car apart. 
uh, it takes a lot of time. And even though I've restored many of this exact same model, it still takes quite a few hours. This particular machine took me about 18 hours to overhaul. They can range anywhere, the 201s can range anywhere from 15 up to 25 hours. I've spent that much time before on a Singer 201. I think that this particular model of Singer is, is so magnificent, it's worth um, the considerable time I invest. So when you look at the price, um, you know, this one has a Centennial badge, so it sells for slightly more, but 90% of all of the, the, the rationale I use for pricing a vintage machine is the labor. And, and, and you'll note that I, I don't just say serviced or tuned up, I actually list out what was done to the machine because there's a lot to do. For example, you know, the bobbin system here, uh, I don't just take the bobbin out and, and squirt oil here. I actually take the bobbin, the bobbin case, and the whole shuttle and race out. These are the parts that, that the, uh, the bobbin works with to sew the bottom stitch. And I take all of that out and I clean it. And very often it's full of old oil and lint. That's, this one was full of it. It was all matted up. And the machine was running, you know, but if, if you didn't look closely, you wouldn't realize that and, and I knew when I bought it, because I've done these before, that it needed do doing. And it's very time consuming. But once it's been done, it's fine. This is not something you would need to do if you bought this machine and were sewing on it. You just need to take a basic lint brush and keep the lint clean, keep it oiled, and you're great. But uh, these are just some of the things you, know, you want to think about when you're looking at a vintage machine and why it makes sense to buy one. If it's not from me, it might be from someone else who does this kind of thing. There are a few, not many of us, but there are people who, who love restoring old uh, all steel sewing machines. We think they're worth it because this machine, now that it's had its overhaul, it should be ready to go for a few more generations, right? If it's if it's used the way it should be, um, and if it is uh, maintained, you know, and just just taken care of, um, it it should last a very long time, and it will outlast any new machine that that you might purchase. So you know, again, whether it's a different model uh, or even a different brand than say Singer, when you're looking at old sewing machines. Um, look at also look at one other thing I want to mention is your foot pedals right or your foot control sometimes they have a knee control but regardless you want to look at those but especially with foot controls you want to take some time if it has its original foot control people like to use those but you want to spend some time sewing on the machine and as you do they will get warm because they were designed they're, they're, they're re they work off resistance and they're designed to, to get warm but you should still be able to comfort comfortably touch it with your hand or your foot if it's getting uncomfortably hot you don't want to use it and it'll need to be replaced if it makes any kind of sound at all um, sometimes they will crackle or they'll make a hissing sound or it could be some other type of sound. Don't use them because a foot pedal or a speed control on a sewing machine is like a little circuit breaker and they can be replaced uh, with new, uh, very often they're electronic or you can get old style as well. But you'll want to make sure that that piece, if you're going to use the original, is in proper working order and it's been inspected and looked at. Otherwise, you'll want to have that, <coughs> that replaced. And those Again, are some of the things you want to look at. Again, parts are not expensive. This bobbin tire, I think, cost me 89 cents. What you really want to pay attention to, and what you should be paying for, is uh, you really want to pay for someone's time to go through the machine properly and get it really set up to sew so that you can enjoy sewing on it. You don't have to worry about it. You can just take basic care of it and maybe maybe once a year give it a, give it a, a, a checkup at a uh, sewing center or with someone like me who works on them. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, there are a lot of other things we could say, but I just wanted to give you some basic ideas for why you would pay. This one's going to list for $325. My God, why would you pay that? Uh, largely, you're paying for the hours that were spent to go through the machine. And uh, uh, again, when you're buying something, it's usually not rare. But uh, if, if you don't buy something that's been serviced and restored, it's going to need that before you start using it. Once it's had that, you will have uh, a machine that I, I really think is just so far superior to most of the junk that is out there in terms of new machines today. Uh, they just don't compare. And these old machines don't really see have to go into service centers very often once they're restored because there's, you know, there's no software to go bad. There's, um, there's not a lot that breaks on them. Usually they don't break. Other than your, your electrical cords, your bobbin tires, your soft parts, you know, the metal parts almost never break if they're taken care of. So anyway, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. And uh, if you have any comments, let me know. Thanks.